What power are you going to raise it to? Somebody said three. power of three, right. So uh, 0.463 meters. The conversion factor, by the way, from meters to centimeters is there's one meter for every 100 centimeters, OK? So that, you have to know that, otherwise you won't be able to do it. Uh, OK, so 0.436 meters cubed times meters on top or on the bottom? Bottom, because you want to uh, cancel meters cubed. So 100 centimeters are in one meter. And now, are we going to raise it to the power of one, two, or three? Three. three. Good. Rewrite the 0.436 meters cubed. And now, let's turn 100 into an exponent. What's another way of saying 100? 10 to the power of 2, but we're raising it also to the power of 3 because we're raising this whole thing to the power of 3. So it's 10 to the power of 2 raised to the power of 3 centimeters cubed over 1 cubed, so it'll still be 1, and meters cubed. Meters cubed cancel. What's 10 to the power of 2 raised to the power of 3? 10 to the power of 6, so 0 0.436 times 10 to the power of 6 centimeters cubed. That doesn't cancel. The 1 does cancel because divide by 1, you still get 1. So we just leave that. There's our answer. Is that in scientific notation? No. What do we want to do? Where do we want to put that decimal now to make it scientific notation? 4.36. Okay. I moved it over by one jump. So that what's going to happen to the power? Since I made this number 10 times bigger, I got to compensate by making this number. 10 times smaller, so they get to the, retain the same value. Okay, so it's 10 to the 5 centimeters cubed. Notice I have not used the calculator to do this conversion factor. Why? Because as long as you're dealing with powers of 10, all you have to do is know your exponents. It's super easy. Let's do number 3. Number three is zero two milliliters going to centimeters cubed. Well, this is a trivial one because, well, you'll see, zero two point one milliliters to centimeters cubed. But all you have to know is that one milliliter is equal to one centimeter cubed, which they sometimes symbolize as cc. This is the SI way of stating it. This is not SI notation, but you see it all the time. Like, for example, when they mark syringes, they say cc's, which is another way of saying centimeter cubed. Or when a motorcycle is sold to you, they'll sometimes tell you the size of the engine. You say, how big is your motorcycle? You say, oh, it's a 450. What are they talking about? Well, 450 cc. It's the amount of room that the piston, go, the cylinder goes up and down. I mean, the piston goes up and down inside a space when it's burning the fuel. So if the engine's bigger, you can burn more fuel and get more power. So for example, in, uh, in uh, dirt bikes, they usually come in two varieties, 250 and 450. Sometimes you can also get 125s. And uh, the 450s are pretty powerful. That's about as much power as most people can handle. I know I can't handle it. Uh, it's, a, it's a scary uh, dirt bike that's 450 cc. Is just, uh, it's so powerful that you can loop out Meaning, if you're going up a hill and you twist the throttle too much, the bike comes out from under you. It literally, wheelies out of control. Or if you lean back too much and you turn the throttle, and then you lose your balance, and you go even further back and you turn the throttle even more, you end up falling off the bike. That's called a whiskey throttle. I don't know why they call it that, but when you whiskey throttle, your, your, your bike wheelies, and then you lose your balance, and you turn the throttle even more, and the whole thing just goes crazy. You flip right off the bike. Anyway, this is a very trivial problem because these two are the same, so you could just say 302.1 milliliters times one centimeter cubed per one milliliter. Milliliters cancel, you get the same number, 302.1 centimeters cubed. It's a trivial question. Let's do the next one. Oh, this next one has two units in the same thing, so that's gonna be a little trickier, but still easy.
right? So it's like 0 0.848 kilograms per liter. Don't be intimidated by this. You just do one thing at a time. You get the right answer in the end. Okay, one, uh, 0.848 kilograms per liter. I'm going to rewrite it in a, in a fraction so you can see it more clearly. But if you write it sideways, it doesn't change anything. Uh, and you want to convert to milligrams per centimeter cubed. Okay, we'll work on one unit at a time. And we'll get both of them. So the first one we're going to work on is the kilograms. So 0 0.848 kilograms. You have to know that one kilogram equals 1,000 grams. And you got to know that one gram equals 1,000 milligrams. So you got to go, you got to hit this one twice. And then the liters, one liter, oops. One liter equals a uh, thousand milliliters, and one milliliter, as we said before, equals one centimeter cube. So we got four conversion factors going on here, but if you follow the technique, you can't get it wrong. It just, it almost works itself out. So here we go. We'll work with the liters first. So, uh, uh, the, sorry, the kilograms first. We want to get rid of kilograms, so I'm going to say a thousand grams per kilogram. Kilograms are gone. Don't worry about the numbers yet. We'll do that later. Uh, now the grams. There's one gram per thousand milligrams. So we're going to say a thousand milligrams per one gram. That gets rid of grams. So now, now we've got milligrams in the numerator. We're good. Now we're going to work on the liters. There's a thousand milliliters in a liter. So I can say 1,000 milliliters. Sorry, no. I can say one liter per 1,000 milliliters. Why did I change my mind? Because liters is on the bottom here, so I want to get rid of it by putting liters on the top. So there we go, liters is gone. Last conversion factor is to get the centimeters cubed. There is one centimeter cubed for every milliliter, so I'll do that. Milliliters cancel, and now what doesn't cancel? Milligrams per centimeter cubed, that's exactly what we're looking for. So now we, now we do the numbers. But let's not give ourselves too much work. Look at this. A thousand cancels with a thousand. So you don't have to worry about that. That's gone. So what hasn't canceled? The 0.848 and the 1,000. So 1,000 times 848, 0.848 gives you 848. And the units that are left over are milligrams on top and centimeters cubed on the bottom. Everything else is canceled or is a one, so you don't worry about ones. Okay, so there's your final answer. Notice I didn't use a calculator. I just did exponents. Or I just did uh, cancellation. Okay, these are actually kind of fun to do when you get good at them. Once you learn the trick, you can just do this whole long thing, and it looks intimidating, but it's actually quite easy because you're following the procedure. Can I give you one and see if you can solve it on your own? All right, let's see. Let's see how independent you are so far. Okay, uh, this one is 81.42. All right, here we go again. Move it over to this side. I need a cameraman. Zero point four two nanometers per second. Oh, let's write it so that you find it easier to see. And I want to convert it into centimeters per minute. I'll give you all the conversion factors that you need. Okay, then you you figure it out. So first of all, one meter equals a hundred centimeters. One meter also equals 10 to the 9 nanometers. One minute is equal to 60 seconds. That's everything you need. Those are all the conversion factors you need. So I'll give you, I'll give you a minute. It shouldn't take more than a minute.
start doing it and see if you can beat me to it. The first step is to get rid of nanometers and turn it into centimeters. I don't know the conversion factor from nanometers to centimeters, but I do know the conversion factor from nanometers to meters, and I do know the conversion factors from meters to centimeters. So I'm going to use two conversion factors, and that's fine. You don't always have to take the straightest road to get to somewhere as long as you get there. So 81.42 nanometers, and I want to put nanometers where to get rid of it? On the bottom. So I'm going to say times one meter per 10 to the 9 nanometers, because there's a billion nanometers in a meter. That allows me to cancel nanometers. Don't worry about the numbers for now. We're only dealing with units right now. Uh, now I want to get rid of meters and turn it into centimeters. Where am I going to put meters? On the bottom. So it's going to have one meter on the bottom. How many centimeters are in the meter? 100. So I'm going to put 100 centimeters on top. See, it almost writes itself. If you know the conversion factor, the, the question, the answer writes itself practically. Just follow the procedure over and over again, and then you worry about doing all the multiplication or the divisions that you need to do. The last step, I'm going to look at seconds now. I want to get rid of seconds and turn them into minutes. So uh, where do I want to put seconds to get rid of them? Are you sure? They're at the bottom now. So you got to put them at the top to get rid of them. So how many seconds are in a minute? 60. So 60 seconds per one minute. So the seconds go. Now, everything is canceled except for what we want, which is centimeters and minutes. Perfect. We're going to get an answer. Now we look at the numbers. So 81.42. Oh, look. 110. What, we can, what can we turn that into? What does 110 cancel down to? Can't I just cross these out and put 10 and 1? Yes, I can. So basically, it's 81.42 times 1 divided 1 times 10 divided 1 times 60 divided 1. Ignore the 1. So really, what it, what it comes down to in your calculator is this part you have to do with a calculator. I can't do that in my head. I'm going to say 81.42. You know what, the 10 to the 9, I don't know why I crossed this part out. You can't cross out the 10 to the 9. 10 to the 9, you can only cross out the 10 to the, uh, the, uh, the nanometers part. 10 to 9 stays. So, never mind. I, I, I just, I didn't notice the 9. I went, I went off the rails there for a second. So what I have to do is, everything that's in the denominator, I divide. Anything that's in the numerator, I multiply. So when I do it on my calculator, I'm going to say, 81.42, and this is where students fall down sometimes with their calculators. They say, sir, I'm not getting the same answer as you. Why? Because they're just doing multiplication all the way across. You do, when it's in the numerator, you multiply. But if the number's in the denominator, you divide. So it's going to be 81.42 divided, 10 to the power by, divided 1, exponent 9. I know it sounds like I'm saying the wrong thing, but when you press the exponent button on your calculator, that's another mistake uh, students make with their calculators. The calculator automatically writes the times 10 part. So don't write another times 10 in there, otherwise you make your answer 10 times bigger. Okay, so 81.42 divided 1 exponent 9 times 100 times 60 equals, and there's your answer, 4.88 we should get 4.8852 times 10 to the power of negative 4, and the units will be centimeters per minute. Okay. Let's pause there for a second and do a rate problem. How many times does your heart beat in a minute on the average? Average heart rate. In a minute? Hmm? In a minute, yeah. You ever take your pulse and see how many times your heart beats in one minute? What is it about? Is it 1,000? Yay! Like if you're a hummingbird, yeah. <laughs> and in a minute, in a minute, a human heart is about 72 beats. 72, yeah. If you're, some people are super healthy and they're, you know, they do, they do a lot of running, they, they might get as low as 40 and people who are very fit 
or in my case, it's about 80. After I eat, it goes up to 90. Uh, so depending on how, you're, how fit you are in cardio, your heart tends to beat less because what has to happen is the blood has to get to your tissues, right? So if enough blood is getting to your tissues, your heart slows down until, until it feels comfortable. And, uh, and some people also have a naturally faster heart rate for whatever reason, they could be nervous. For example, my wife, her heart rate is in the 50s sometimes even lower, but then she suffers from low, bre uh, low blood pressure. Mine's always in the 80s, but uh, I think it's, uh, here's the amazing thing. Your heart's a pump, right? Your heart can last 80 years. There is no pump on the market that you can buy that'll last 80 years. If you go to Canadian Tire and buy a sump pump, and you know, you put in your basement to pump out when it starts to flood, you'll be lucky if it lasts maybe five years. Most pumps break down. How many times do you think your heart beats in, in your lifetime? We can find that out. We'll do a simple calculation. Because anytime you have a rate and some time, you can find out the distance, okay? So here's the formula. Rate times time equals distance. This is a formula that you use more often than you realize. If you eat three ice creams per day for three days how many ice creams are you going to eat? You, you eat three ice creams every day for three days in a row. How many ice creams did you eat? Nine ice creams. See look, days cancel. Three times three is nine ice creams. Okay? You just did a rate problem. You did it in your head. You already know how to do rate problems, you just don't know the formula. The formula is whatever the rate is, times the time that you, you spend doing whatever it is you're doing, is gonna equal the distance you cover. The distance doesn't have to be only meters, it can be ice creams. You know, you, if you elbow your, bro your little brother five times a day for five days, how many times did you elbow your brother? Go like this five times in a day for five days. How many times did you do like this to your brother? 25 times, right? So that's a rate. Hope you don't elbow your brother, but that's a rate. And if you do it for five days, it's 25 elbows. Typically, when we do rate uh, problems, they involve a speed. Like you're driving 100 kilometers an hour for five hours. How far do you go? 100 kilometers an hour for five hours. How far did you go? 500 kilometers. See, you did 100 kilometers per hour times five hours, okay? 100 times five gives you 500. Hours cancel, and you get 500 kilometers distance. You see? That's how the formula works. Now, let's find out how many times your heart beats in your lifetime. How, ma how long do you plan to live? What would you like to live? How long would you like to live? 95 years? Yeah, that's a good time. But well, I'd like to live... I'd like to live 200 years, but only if I could be young. Because who wants to be old for 150 years? There's, a, there's some Greek mythology story where I forget the name of the character, but she asks for eternal life. And the god gives it to her, but he uh, plays a trick on her. He doesn't give her eternal youth. So she's eternal, she lives forever, but she turns into a horrible, ugly old hag. But she can't die. So she's all bent and gnarled and looking decrepit, but she continues to live. So living a long time is not necessarily a blessing. It depends on, and it depends on how your life plays out. But let's pretend your heart beats 72 beats a minute. Okay, and let's also pretend that you live to be 100 years old. And by the way, that's a pretty good uh, age to reach. I once walked through a graveyard. I took a nice long hour and a half walk. I didn't see anybody who lived 100 years. Nobody. I saw one couple that lived to be 99. They were buried next to each other. They both lived 99 years old. So maybe a good marriage is good for your health. I don't know. Yeah. You walked by yourself? Yeah, I was walking by myself. I do that sometimes. 
I, the, the older you get, the more you like to be alone. You don't mind. No, no, it's not scary. If you do, if, if you do it uh, during the daytime, it's not scary. But even at night, it shouldn't be too scary. You know what makes me nervous is riding my bike on the path near my house at night. There it looks spooky. Those people who are sometimes in the bushes and they're drinking, you, you never know what's going to happen. Okay, so 72 beats a minute. Pretend you live 100 years. Uh, how many minutes are there in an hour? Okay, so first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to use rate times time equals distance. We're trying to find how many beats your heart has in the whole lifetime. We know the rate is 72 beats per minute. Okay? And we know the time is 100 years, but we have to turn the... We have to time the turn 100 years into minutes. Okay, so here's here's the rate part. We've got the rate. Now we're going to multiply by time. The time parts can take up a lot of space because it's a lot of conversion factors. There's 60 minutes per one hour. There's how many hours in a day? 24 hours in a day. So we're going to put hours on top because I want to get rid of hours. How many days in a year? 365 and a quarter. Don't forget that quarter. Days in one year. And then you want to live for 100 years. Okay. Now let's see what we can cancel. Hours cancel. Days cancel. Years cancel. Uh, and minutes cancel. So your answer is going to be in beats everything except beats cancels so all we do is multiply those numbers to find out how much your heart would beat if it beats an average of 72 times a minute for a hundred years and the number will surprise you 72 times 60 times 24 times 365.25 times 100 gives you three billion 786,912,000 beats. So your heart, if you live 100 years, will probably not reach 4 billion beats. That's a sobering thought. You have a short life, and then most people don't make it to 100 years. Most people go to about 80. Uh, teachers live to be 87 on the average. So, There's a famous, well, he's not a famous doctor, but he said, somebody asked him, should I jog to make, to live longer? He says, no, the heart only has so many beats. If you want to live longer, take a nap. <laughs> so there may be some truth to that, you know, that if you push too hard, you might wear out your heart. And I know, I know for a fact that some runners end up with heart problems. If you push your heart too hard, it actually gets bigger. And when the heart gets bigger, it doesn't work as well because the muscle is too thick. And when the muscle is too thick, it doesn't stretch properly and it doesn't pump the blood as well. So it ends up having to work faster. And it, anyway, it, just, it starts to get worse. So uh, an efficient heart is a small heart. So if your heart stays small and flexible, it tends to work better. When it gets too big, it, it doesn't work well, especially when it's not under a load. Uh, how much time do we have? an hour good I can cover I'd like to give you this factual label sheet but you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna I'm gonna give you this as a photocopy next class so Wednesday when you guys come back and you can work on these uh, these type of problems on your own I want you guys to get really good at it so that you're comfortable with them not so that I have to coach you coach you through the steps right now are you starting to get it is it making some sense to you are you getting some of the answers before I do Yes, no, maybe. Okay, well then we need more practice. I, I, uh, you're either being very humble or you or you're don't know what you're doing yet. So we're gonna keep track, uh, uh, practicing this until you're comfortable with it because I think it's an important skill in science. It keeps coming up all through the grades. From all the way from grade nine to 12, you're gonna need this skill if you're gonna pursue a science background. So you need some of the basics in math. It's a super important skill, and that's why uh, it's important for you guys to learn. 
The next thing I want to do is the surface area of the earth. So we're going to do, um, I had a handout here a minute ago, what was it? Okay, uh, find the surface area of the earth. Then we'll ask Siri how heavy the earth is, and then we'll find out the density of the earth. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, I meant to say um, also volume. Not surface area. You need the volume of the earth. But we're going to find both. You remember in uh, geometry class or math class, they taught you the area of a sphere? So earth is a sphere, right? It's a, it's a big circle with three dimensions, so that's what we call a sphere. So the area of a sphere is four times pi times the radius squared. And the volume of a sphere, the formula is four times pi, uh, sorry, four over three pi times the radius to the power of three. So those are the formulas. So surface area, you could say SA if you like, and the volume, you could say this V. So we know, the. I know the dimension of the Earth in miles, because I was raised in the time when they were still using that uh, unit. But we can work at that and convert it over to kilometers and then find the surface area of the Earth. So here's your first question. What is the surface area of Earth in kilometers? And you know what I'd like to find out is, uh, suppose the Earth were completely equally shared. How much land would you get? Of course, uh, you might not get the land you want, but how much land would you get? Or maybe you'd get a parcel of the ocean. That wouldn't be too cool. What are you going to do with water? But we can, we can modify our calculation. How much of the Earth is covered in land? roughly as a fraction, or even as a percent. What percent of the Earth is, is land? Anyone have an idea? It's about, it's about one third. It's around 30%. Okay. I remember seeing a commercial for a water ski, which stuck with me. I remember I was in my teens when I saw it. It said, uh, O'Brien, that was the name of the water ski company. O'Brien, because the earth is two-thirds water. So what is the surface area of the earth if uh, earth has a diameter of 7,926 miles? So if you dug a hole from here and you dug all the way until you got to the center of the earth and then came out on the other side, you'd, you'd come out somewhere in China, I think. Don't quote me on that. You might, you might come out in the middle of the ocean for all. Uh, you'd need a globe to do it well, to really calculate that properly. You want to hear something cool? The Pacific Ocean is so big that there are places in the Pacific Ocean that if you dug through the center of the earth, like you started at the surface and went down through the center of the earth and came out on the other side, you'd still be in the Pacific Ocean. That's how big the Pacific Ocean is. There are, there are places in the Pacific Ocean where it covers more than half the earth. It's a, it's a giant body of water. Where? Diameter? 
That's the area. The diameter means if you have a sphere or a circle, it's the distance across it. So on the Earth, that distance is 7,926 miles. It's a bit more, the Earth is a bit fatter than it is tall because it spins, so that tends to stretch it out a bit. The Earth is actually uh, 13 miles this way more than it is high because of that effect. The Earth is actually a bit of an oval. It's a spheroid. Nothing is a perfect sphere, although uh, the bigger uh, body is, the closer it tends to get to that because gravity helps to even out the surface. In fact, in planets that have less gravity than the Earth, you'll see mountains that are way higher than you see on Earth. So in Mars, the gravity is only about 30% of what it is on the Earth. So there, there, there's a mountain on Mars, which is, I think, uh, 30 miles in altitude. It's higher than any of the mountains on the Earth. But the Earth, on Earth, the gravity is such that once the mountain gets high enough, it's harder for it to get higher because the weight of the mountain itself tends to push it back down into the earth. So the surface area of the earth, before we find out the surface area of the earth, let's find out uh, what the radius of the earth is in kilometers. That way you can just plug it into the formula and get the answer. So we have 7,926 miles we're going to convert that to kilometers. You need a few conversion factors to do that. I'm going to write them up there. I'm going to erase this part. You'll see how they get used one after another. So one mile equals 5,280 feet. One foot equals 12 inches. One inch equals 2.54 centimeters, uh, one, one meter equals a hundred centimeters, and one kilometer equals a thousand meters. Those are all the conversion factors we're going to use to do this calculation. So we're, at, we're starting off at miles. Let's use feet. So 5,280 feet per one mile. So does anyone know what the tallest mountain in the world is? It's Mount Everest. Mount Everest is 28,000 feet high. That's about uh, six miles, almost six miles, five and a bit miles high. Right. The mountain is so high, it's actually higher no, not, it's not higher than what airplanes fly, but it's getting close. Airplanes fly at around 35,000 feet. So Mount, Mount Everest is about uh, 7,000 feet lower than that. But when you're at the, standing at the top of Mount Everest, there's only one third as much air. So when you breathe in, you gotta breathe in three times to get the same amount of oxygen as you do from breathing once at the surface of the earth. So it's like breathing through a drinking straw and you gotta be super fit to even survive being at the top of Mount Everest. In fact, when, when, uh, when the mountain climbers get to what they call the death, the death zone, no matter how fit you are, you can only be there for about 24 hours. If you stay longer than that, it kills you because there's just not enough oxygen. You're breathing so rapidly that it throws all your, uh, it throws all your body uh, homeostasis out of balance. Uh, you literally, are, you're starting to die when you get to that altitude. And, and by the way, Mount Everest is littered with bodies because of people trying to climb it and either the cold or the low oxygen or both uh, have killed many people on the way up. And, and then if you die up there, they don't really do anything for it. There are bodies that have been up there for 10, 15 years. They're just frozen, still wearing their jacket and their boots and everything else. Uh, it's a very dangerous, very dangerous practice, mountain climbing. So after we get rid of miles, what's the next logical step? What are we trying to get rid of next? Feet. feet. You see anything with feet in there? We've already used this one, so we don't use that one anymore. 
So you see any other conversion factor with feet in it? Yeah, feet going to inches. Okay, how are we going to set that up? Help me out, I forget. What do I do now? Hmm? We're trying to get rid of uh, feet. Good, yeah. One foot in the denominator, yep. And what we put on top? 12 inches. Okay, good. That gets rid of feet. Now we've got inches to get rid of. You see anything there with inches? Yeah, where do we want to put it? On the bottom. And what have what we put on top? 2.54 centimeters. Okay, that gets rid of inches. Now we want to get rid of centimeters. What next? Go to meters. So centimeters on the bottom, meters on top, that gets rid of centimeters. And the very last conversion is to go to kilometers. So I'm going to put kilometers on top and meters on the bottom. Meters cancel. And now when we do all that, we'll see how many kilometers the Earth is in diameter. By the way, one mile is exactly 1.609344 kilometers. Or you could say 1,600,009,000 uh, millimeters. You'll do that calculation enough times that you're, you'll probably memorize it. So 7,926 times 5,280 times 12 times 2.54 divided 100 divided oh it's 1,000 not 100 nobody caught me on that huh that was an easy one could have had a bonus mark right there and the answer is 12,000 Seven hundred and fifty-five point six six zero five kilometers. So the Earth's diameter in kilometers is this. How much is the radius compared to the diameter? Easy question. What's bigger, radius or diameter? Guys, this is the. Diameter is bigger, okay, the radius is half of that. Here's a radius, right? So the radius is half the diameter. You knew that, right? Okay. So I'll take half of this number and what's it gonna give me? If I take half the diameter of the Earth, what does it give me? It gives me the radius of the Earth. That's what I wanna do, so because uh, one and a half of the diameter equals the radius. I'll multiply that by one and a half or divide by two, same thing. Divide by two, we get 6,377.83027 kilometers. That's the diameter of the Earth. We're nowhere near finished. We still have to now calculate the surface area of the Earth. Surface area of any sphere is 4 times pi times the radius squared. So let's plug in those numbers. 4 times pi, which is in our calculator, so we'll just write pi. And then we'll put this number in squared. 6,377.83027 kilometers, all squared. Let's see what we get. So I'm going to square that number. see what I'm getting at. I'm going to, once I find out how much area of land is on the earth, I'm going to pretend the earth is a fair place where everybody gets an equal share of the land. Which of course doesn't happen, but you know, it's fun to dream. So x squared. Okay, so this is what we get. 4 pi times this number squared gives you uh, 40 million 
676,719. Yeah. Okay. So you just square. Now multiply that by 4 pi times 4. Where's the pi? Pi equals. There we go. So the Earth is 511 million 156,726 kilometers squared. If you count the whole surface of the Earth. But, of course, only one-third of that is land. So we're going to say that it's a rough calculation by times one-third. Actually, we can ask Siri about this. Oh, but I don't have my calculator. I don't have my phone available because it's filming me. But if some, does anyone have Siri available? Can somebody ask Siri how, what percentage of the earth is land? Nobody has Siri? Nobody has data? Okay, well, pretend it's one third then. And take a third of that number. So there's 170 million 386,242 kilometers squared of land on the Earth. What's the. Uh, What's the population of the Earth? Seven billion. So you could find out how many kilometers square there are for persons on the Earth's land. If we were all equally spread out on the Earth, how, how far, how much land would each person have? So if there's a... Uh, have it in kilometers per square, uh, squared per person or persons per square kilometer which one would you rather have persons per square kilometers or kilometers per person do you want to know how much land you have for yourself or do you want to know how many people there are in one kilometer squared of land which one would you prefer to know I'd rather know how much land I have for myself so I'm gonna say kilometers squared per person so I'll put this over the population of the Earth. So 170,386,242 kilometers squared per 7 billion persons. So we're going to find out how much each one of us has. So each one of us has 2.43 one seven times 10 to the minus two kilometers squared. So one edge of that, if you take the square root, would be 0 0.156. So, or times a thousand meters per kilometer, 156 meter. So if we were to, it, if we were to spread everybody out evenly on the surface of the earth, each one of us, here's, here's us standing in the middle of our land, we have 156 by 156 meters. It's a pretty nice parcel. And of course, if you had a family of five, you'd have five times that much. Doesn't seem like so much though, does it? 156 meters is uh, one and a half football fields. So you'd have one and a half football fields this way and then one and a half football fields that way. Actually, it's more than you need if you have to cut the lawn on that, it's a lot of work. But there are so many places on the earth where <clears throat> there's just nobody, just barren rock. You know, if you go up north in Canada, it's just rock and, uh, and, and lakes and mosquitoes. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't even be farmable land because the soil is very thin there. There's very little soil 
up north. The best soils are from here to about a couple hundred miles north of here. And then uh, after that, you, you get into what's called Canadian Shield, because that part of Canada used to be a mountain. So it got worn down, so it's now a flat mountain. But 450 million years ago, it was sharp mountains. Actually, 450 million years ago, right here, it was, just, it was an ocean. This area was underwater. If you look everywhere around here, you see seashells in the ground. How do you think seashells get onto dry land? They don't. It used to be underwater. So that's why if you go dig in your backyard, you'll see little fossilized seashells. That's because this area used to be an ocean about 450 million years ago. If you go to Milton, you see the escarpment. You've heard of the Milton? You've heard of the escarpment, right? The Niagara Escarpment? It used to be an underwater reef. So you can imagine little fish swimming along it, you know, conducting their lives. Now it's a little mountain. If you drive on the 401 going west, when you get to Milton, you'll see it's like this long sort of, not a mountain, this is kind of like a, an escarpment. It's a, it's a hill, really. But that used to be underwater 400 million years ago. Okay, we found the surface area of the Earth, which is a big sphere. We can do the same or similar calculation to find out the um, volume of the Earth. And now we're going to use the density formula to find out the density of the Earth. But we have to know the mass of the Earth, which I Somebody has to look it up on Siri. I vaguely remember that the mass of the Earth to be around 10 to the 35 kilograms, but I don't know the exact number. Here's the question that we're going to work together. Given that the Earth has a mass of blank, I can look that up, uh, and a diameter of 12,755 kilometers. What is the density? What is the average density of the Earth? I have a. Yeah. Of what? Kilograms? Kilograms? Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe the other one is the. 35 is the mass of the sun, probably. That's what I was remembering. Okay, so the mass of the Earth is 5.972 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. It doesn't look so big when you write it in scientific notation, does it? Uh, it is, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of mass. But the Earth is actually a small planet compared to the other planets in the solar system. You'll notice that in the solar system, all the rocky, heavy planets, in terms of density, are closer to the sun. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are rocky planets. All the other planets are gas giants. You can't even land on them because they, they don't have ground. They don't have a surface. For example, Jupiter is like a big cloud. If you were to try to land on Jupiter, you would, go, you would hit its atmosphere, and the atmosphere would get thicker and thicker and thicker. At some point, you would just be in such a heavy, high-pressure high atmosphere that it would crush your spaceship, that you would never actually reach a surface. You might, you might reach a liquid surface, but it, it wouldn't be an actual uh, surface, and it would vary depending on the altitude. So it would be a, be a very odd experience to land on the surface of Jupiter. And probably the winds on Jupiter are beyond anything we would ever be able to imagine. I know that on the planet Uranus, which is also a gas giant, there are winds of 1,500 kilometers per hour. So. We, we don't see anything like that on the Earth. The fastest wind we'll ever see on the Earth is maybe 500 kilometers per hour, like the worst hurricane that you'll ever see or the worst tornado. 
will not go must, much past 500 kilometers per hour. And at those speeds, um, pieces of wood have been driven through trees. In some tornadoes, the, the, you'll see a tree standing, and then there's a two by four through the, through the tree, that kind of thing, where it'll bend the stop sign down to the ground. That's how strong those kind of winds are. Or it'll, in some tornadoes, they'll, it'll pick up livestock and deposit it somewhere else. That's rare, usually the livestock gets killed from being lifted and thrown. It'll lift a car and put it down somewhere else. That's some pretty violent wind. But the, the strongest winds on Earth are nothing compared to the winds that are on the other planets, like uh, Uranus, Neptune, possibly Saturn and, and Jupiter as well. They're not very hospitable places. So let's find the answer to this question. Let's move the phone so you can see what's going on. We framed the question, and now we're going to solve it using our formula for the volume of the planet. We know that the volume of a sphere is given by 4 over 3 pi r cubed. We've already been given the, uh, the diameter of the Earth. Let's plug it into the formula and find out the volume of the Earth. 4 over 3 pi times 12,755 over 2, because we want the radius. And then we're going to raise that to the power of 3. This is where having a calculator is obviously going to be uh, indispensable. I don't recommend you try to do these kind of problems with your phone. It ends up being an exercise in frustration. The phones have a calculator, I understand, but it's not as user-friendly as a real calculator. So 12,755 kilometers divided by 2 gives you 6,377 kilometers. That's the radius. But now we're going to raise that radius to the power of 3 because we're trying to find volume. I can hardly breathe here. So we're going to raise it to the power of 3 and we get uh, 2.5938809 times 10 to the power of 11. Okay, so let's write that down. So 4 over 3 pi times uh, 2.59, 388, 909 times 10 to the power of 11 kilometers cubed. Times 4 pi divided 3. And we get this. So the Earth's volume is 1.8652572 times 10 to the power of 12 kilometers cubed. But we want to turn it into something we can work with. What are the units of density? I think I told you last week. I don't really expect you to remember, but anybody do remember? The units for density, it's in grams per centimeter cubed. Does that ring a bell? Grams per centimeter cubed. So we got to turn this into centimeters cubed. That's a big number. But don't be afraid because we have the power of exponential notation to help us. In one kilometer, there's a thousand meters. But we're going to raise that to the power of three. And in one meter, there are 100 centimeters. And we're going to raise that to the power of 3 as well. So let's perform our calculation using exponential notation for as long as we can without using our calculators. So 1.086, I'm, I'm not going to rewrite the whole number because this is going to be time consuming, but times 10 to the 12 kilometers cubed times another way of rewriting this factor is 10 to the power of 3 raised to the power of 3 meters cubed over 1 cubed milli kilometer cubed, put that back in the bracket, and this one we can rewrite as 10 to the power of 2 raised to the power of 3 centimeters cubed over 1 cubed meter cubed. 
put that back in the bracket. Remember, now we've distributed that power in there, right? That allows us to cancel kilometers, and it allows us to cancel meters. Now let's get all the powers in the number all lined up. 10 to the 12. 10 to the 3 raised to the 3 is times 10 to the 9. And 10 to the 2 raised to the 3 is 10 to the 6. And everything else cancels. The 1s are, are still 1s, so we don't bother with them. At the end, your answer is in centimeters cubed. So let's rewrite this now. Add up all the powers. 9 plus 6 is 15. 15 plus 12 is 27. So you get 1.08, etc., times 10 to the 27 centimeters cubed. That's the volume of the Earth in centimeters cubed. Imagine that. You can't do that in your calculator. You can't enter the numbers. They, they won't fit in the readout. You have to use the you'd have to use exponential notation to do it. So now we're going to use, this is the volume. Here's the mass. We're going to turn that into kilograms, into grams rather. So we're going to say 5.972 times 10 to the 24 kilograms times 1,000 grams per one kilogram. That's going to add three zeros to there. So it becomes nine. 5.972 times 10 to the 27 grams. So now we have the mass, we have the volume, and we know that density equals mass over volume. So let's plug in the numbers. Here's the mass, 5.927 times 10 to the 27 grams. And here's the density, here's the volume. 1.08 times 10 to the 27 centimeters cubed. Look at that, 10 to the 27 cancels. So the density of the Earth in grams per centimeter cubed uh, is 5.927 divided 1.08. Six five two five seven two. That gives you five point four five. We're only going to report it to three sig negative three significant figures. Doesn't make more sense to go higher than that. Uh, so five point six grams per centimeter cube. That's the average density of the Earth. So the Earth is. A, quite a lot denser than water. Water has a density of 1. Iron has a density of 7.8. So the Earth is almost as dense as iron. If you could put the Earth in a giant bathtub, would it float? Denser than water. Do rocks float? No. So the Earth would not float. It's actually five times denser than water. It's even denser than aluminum. If you had a ball of aluminum as big as the Earth, it would only weigh half as much. Now, if you guys can do one of these calculations by yourself, one, I'll be very proud of you, and two, I'll be very satisfied that I've managed to teach you some important science skills. So, here's what we can do for work to practice I still haven't tried uploading uh, that so I can't assign anything from there okay let's try this I'll give you these ones Can I erase this? Yet? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, it's on it's on video so you can watch it if you don't get the whole thing. Try this as a homework assignment. It's a similar type of problem. Actually, this is too easy. 
question. Iron has a density of 7.86 uh, grams per centimeter cubed. How much would a ball of iron two meters across, two meters in diameter away? Okay, remember, the volume of a sphere is four over three pi r cubed. And one meter equals 100 centimeters. That's what you need to solve this. And you also need your density equation. Density equals mass over volume. So I've given you this, and I've given you the information necessary to calculate this. I'm asking you for that. Okay? So I've given you a hint. If you can do that, you've learned all this. But if you don't get it, don't freak out, because you're still starting out, okay? But see if you can manage to solve that problem. I'll let you work on it for the next uh, 20 minutes, and it could be your homework. Stop it there.